Oh, hey, an Indiana Jones tie-in. Only a month and a half after Dial of Destiny came out. Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings went into production about the same time as Star Wars The Force Unleashed, with the titles being planned as a brilliant one-two punch to reclaim LucasArts' throne as the KING of licensed games! Yeah, that didn't happen. While Force Unleashed went on to critical and commercial success and immense fandom love, Staff of Kings ended up in a development hell more cursed than any relic Dr. Jones has ever plundered. Employees were pulled from Staff of Kings to get Force Unleashed out the door, LucasArts couldn't get Staff of Kings' physics engines, plural, to work right, interest in the project dropped off after Kingdom of the Crystal Skull met a tepid reception, we'll say, and probably the death knell, Uncharted, came out. Developer morale kind of fell off a cliff when exactly the same game starring more or less the same characters they were working on beat them to the punch. So Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings ended up being cancelled entirely. Kind of. See, much like The Force Unleashed, LucasArts had already farmed the IP out to other developers to make ports of Staff of Kings for the Wii, PSP, and Nintendo DS. So today, we're looking at the second-hand Wii port of a game that was never released. Grand. But hey, the game was made by A2M, who made that spectacular Iron Man Wii game that vastly surpassed the high-def version anyway. Maybe Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings on the Wii won't be so bad. Oh shoot, sorry about that. I really need to clean my glasses. Man, that was nuts. For a second there, I thought that the game footage was... Blurry to high holy hell. Yeah, we're going to start out with what may be my pettiest complaint about a game, but the entire graphical design of Staff of Kings revolves around soft lighting. Or bloom, as it's apparently called. It's an effect where everything around light sources is made to look fuzzy, and I hate, 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 HATE soft lighting with a fiery passion! Every single time that I boot up Staff of Kings, it just punches me in the face how unbelievably butt fogly everything in the game looks. Most of the damn game looks blurry, even down to the main menu, and it's goddamn intolerable. Why does it look like this? Are they trying to make it look mysterious or exotic like everywhere you go is foggy? Because it doesn't look like fog, it looks like your camera lens is smeared with bacon grease. This is the most unpleasant to look at game that I've played in a long time. To put it charitably, the game is fucking ugly! Ugh. The game begins in Sudan, 1939, as Indy comes upon a temple that's swarming with Nazis. Indy opts to look for another entrance and... Wow. Okay, I swear I'll get off the graphical design in a second, but look at this! First screen of the game, and Indy is the exact same color as the background of the dirt! The first level of the game is a long tutorial, and it starts by explaining that contextual motion controls are used extensively for basic navigation. Pick up a torch by waving the remotes together to mime using a flint. Wave remote to mime using the torch to flail off spiders and to light fires. Swing both remotes to mime running away from obstacles, and about 93% of the ledges that you climb will collapse on you so that you can flail both remotes for Indy to regain his grip. I don't mind Wii games using gimmicky motion control gestures, but so many of the shoehorned quick time events in Staff of Kings force you to flail both remotes up and down for seconds at a time, and that gets annoying as balls. It gets worse when you realize just how badly programmed the quick time events really are, but we'll get to that later. At least the game always flashes the gestures that you're supposed to do on the screen so you don't have to memorize a ton of motion controls. CAUSE THAT WOULD SUCK! In the meantime, soak in that Indiana Jones feel as Indy treks through caverns infested with spiders, finds an idol, has to run out of a collapsing temple, encounters a rival out to steal his treasure from him, and frantically escapes in an airplane. Enjoy the indie feeling that comes from the devs deliberately copying the opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark because they had no faith that a new Indiana Jones game could stand on its own. The game's villain is Magnus Voller, a Nazi archaeologist and former associate of Indies who studied under the same super important and hitherto unknown teacher, Professor Charles Kingston. Professor Kingston was right about you. I'm just glad he's not around to see it. Indy makes a run for it, and now we get a tutorial for the combat! 
Now the bad news is that the combat runs entirely on remote waggles, but the good news is that Staff of Kings' combat system is simple, streamlined, elegant, and very easy to grasp. You have three basic punches, a jab, hook, and uppercut by swinging the remote or a nunchuck forward, left, or upward. Each has a different speed and damage output. If there are contextual prompts nearby, you can hold B and swing the remote to use the whip to collapse structures for instant takedowns, and you can press A to pick up weapons. Once holding a weapon, you can either swing the remote horizontally to attack or swing down while pressing A to throw it. Only don't press A unless you're swinging the remote down, because otherwise you'll just drop the weapon. If there aren't contextual prompts nearby, you can hold B and swing the remote to use the whip. You swing it vertically, but not explicitly downward to disarm enemies. Horizontally to whip enemies around the waist and downward to whip their legs, then swing the remote up to reel them in for damage, except you have to swing the remote upward to reel them in really quickly or else it doesn't work. You hold the Z button to grab enemies to punch them and you look for different contextual cues to bash enemies into the environment or throw them through doors, but you have to make sure that these different environmental cues are nearby or else grappling doesn't really do jack shit. However, several enemies will be immune to certain kinds of attacks and some enemies are completely invincible to all that bullshit and the only way to fight them is to press A and B simultaneously to dodge and counter them like this was Batman Arkham Asylum! You got all that? The combat is extremely clunky. It's meant to evoke indie being an everyman who's constantly outmatched and has to use his wits to get by, but the end result is that everything is guesswork. You will get swarmed by enemies who at random will consistently dodge or shrug off attacks and beat the shit out of you, and you just have to try out all your moves until something works, which gets you killed. The quick jab is the only punch worth using, but the motion detection will often screw up and read it as the much slower hook instead. The whip takes so long to use on a single enemy that you will take damage from someone else. The insta-kill terrain is hard to spot and so insanely specific to use that you can barely get them to do crap. Even the all-purpose counter move doesn't work because lots of enemies don't telegraph attacks and will keep decking you if you miss the timing once. Picking up weapons to use on the enemies is the only strategy I found that consistently works, and even that has problems since most weapons either break or they're single-use throwing items. You wanted your main character to feel like an underpowered dork? Congratulations! You succeeded! Ah uh, yes, and after the combat tutorial, Indy flies a plane to escape Sudan. You fly it by holding your Wii Remote upright and moving it like an old-style steering yoke, while the nunchuck is still poking out the bottom of it. This feels so insanely awkward. Out of nowhere, Indy just friggin' teleports to... I don't know, China? If the screen were less blurry, maybe I could make it out! A hitherto unknown friend, Archie Tan, has told Indy that Kingston has been missing for six years. Funny, since Indy talked like he was dead. I'm just glad he's not around to see it. And a relic called the Jade Sphere is tied to his disappearance. But first you have to save this random girl from gangsters, because shut up. Yes, welcome to the first instance of having to stop and look shit up for this game to make any sense. The game has a journal feature where you can find information on the relics you collect, locations, story recaps, and character bios. And in the journal, it explains that this is actually San Francisco. Archie Tan is an antique dealer that museum curator Marcus is familiar with. The kidnapped girl is Tan's granddaughter, and both have been targeted by gangsters hired by Voller because they want what Kingston was after. They still don't explain why Tan waited six friggin' years to get help for a missing person, but whatever. And now it's time for the shooting tutorial, because the game has gunplay with Indy and his trusty revolver. And by gunplay, I mean the most stock arcade gallery shooter ever. You hold the control stick to stand out of cover, aim with the Wii Remote's pointer, and you shoot. That's it. And they still managed to screw that up, because I got stuck on the friggin' tutorial! The first shooting encounter pits you against a guy who cannot be killed. You can try shooting him all damn day, He'll shrug off bullets and just nail you back the second that he pops out of cover. But the game shooting cursor turns green if you're aiming at something that can be shot, and some levels expect you to shoot the environment to proceed. Okay, makes sense, and there's a giant swinging sack of explosives that blows up every time I shoot it. Simple enough. Only one problem. Shooting the giant explosive sack doesn't work either! Why is this thing a target if shooting it doesn't do crap? So after dying like three times, I found out that there are tiny little explosive boxes under the platforms, one of which is hidden off screen and only visible if you wander off to the left for no real reason and shooting those. 
is what ends the tutorial. And this is pretty much the only point in the entire game that moving behind cover is not only possible, but required. But wait! Was that not convoluted enough for you? Because in the next shootout, you have to fight another invincible enemy! Or maybe it's the same guy, I don't friggin' know. Trying to actually shoot the bad guy gets you killed, so take a good look on the screen here. Guess what you're supposed to shoot to advance the fight? The water tower? Close. That's for the next phase of the encounter. The boxes with bright yellow warning labels on them to indicate that they're explosive and sitting two feet away from the bad guy? Wrong! You give up? You shoot the light dangling above his head. Because yeah, getting blown up doesn't hurt him, being shot in the face doesn't hurt him, but dropping a cheap lantern on him is what sends him fleeing in terror. But you know what the sickest part is? These two shootouts in the tutorial are the only point in the entire game where you fight invincible enemies. There's only one other spot in the game where you have to shoot the environment to advance. The rest of the gunfights are just stock shooting galleries, so the game introduces this crap just to mess with you. Tan's granddaughter takes you to Archie's place, where apparently now it turns out that he's been kidnapped before we even got here. The game's storytelling is so damn jarring with how much crap just happens or already happened with no transition. But it turns out that Archie Tan's antique shop has a secret hidden basement with a secret tunnel down to where there's a giant pirate ship buried under San Francisco! Bullshit! You're left to explore the famous San Francisco underground pirate ship, and this is the last great failing of the gameplay here. There are multiple levels built around exploring giant tombs and temples like a classic Indiana Jones adventure, but it just feels insanely restrictive. You can't jump, and you won't climb ledges unless they're mandatory, and interaction prompts don't appear unless you're close enough to sneeze on them. So exploring the giant wondrous locations boils down to bungling around until you stumble across the one thing in the room that you can interact with. It honestly reaches the point of comedy when you realize you are literally just throwing Indy into every wall you can find hoping something happens. Man, I'm hungry. I need to get something for breakfast. Yay! Nutri-grain bars! When you reach the deck of the ship, Indy's cornered by the Triad, who threaten him with a cannon if he doesn't give up the Jade Sphere's location. Well, gee! It's like the easiest game of Where's Waldo ever! The Jade Sphere is sitting on top of a box of cannonballs two feet away from the bad guys! And what kills me is, not only is the Jade Sphere in plain sight and the brightest thing in this dank, blurry-ass cave, but the bad guys had to have reached into this box of cannonballs to load the cannon pointed at Indy! Their hands were centimeters away from a bright green glowing MacGuffin and they still didn't see it! You better talk fast, Dr. Jones, or you're gonna have words with my boys, Farsight Freddy and Cataract Carl! Of course, I mock the bad guys for being dumb, but there are multiple fights in the game where the AI shoots its own partners. Indy shoots his way out with the Jade Sphere, gives Volor the slip, and he knows that the Jade Sphere comes from Panama because shut up. Once in Panama, he picks up a traveling companion, Maggie O'Malley, a photojournalist who just happens to be in Panama, runs into some random guy who claims to be an archaeologist, and just immediately starts following Indy around without question. Sure, why not? It's an Indiana Jones adventure. A girl travel companion is just part of the formula. This is where I started noticing general bugginess in the game's programming, starting with the fact that the pause button doesn't work. You have to press and hold the plus button for like a full second for the game to realize that you're pushing pause because you want to pause! Several contextual commands either won't appear or only pop up if you're randomly standing in an infuriatingly precise and arbitrary spot. And when Indy encounters some exotic Panamanian Nazis, I learned that the waggle running quick time events are hard-coded 
to only respond if you shake the remotes at a specific speed. A speed that always changes and that you have to guess through trial and error. I failed these events by swinging the remotes too fast and I am not making that up. You fight Nazis in a village with rampant frame rate stutters, teleporting natives, and a bugged cutscene where ghost barrels phase through the bad guys. The natives give something to Indy with no explanation unless you stop to read the extras, and you settle in for many long sequences of fumbling around a temple for stuff you can interact with to proceed. You also fight a fire-breathing Nazi guy. I have no idea how this fight works. You can't get close to him. The only weapons you're given to throw don't do shit and whipping him does nothing. I know you wait for him to throw a torch, which is somehow your cue to whip his legs and land some punches, and that something you do can prompt the torch throwing, but I don't know how. It's just the kind of brilliant guesswork that the game was totally built around on purpose. There's one kind of neat puzzle in this temple where you have to dodge giant rolling boulders as you run around hitting switches. The rest of it is stumbling around and wondering why the hell key contextual prompts didn't appear the first two times you came through this room! Indy uses the Jade Sphere to open a vault that has Kingston's journal in it for reasons that I cannot fathom! Seriously, he came here once, brought back the Jade Sphere to the States, then came back through all the puzzles and traps again to hide a journal! And he hid this journal in a space that only two living people can access! ONE OF WHOM IS THE MAIN VILLAIN! I'm starting to think that Kingston was a crackpot! Anyway, Kingston was looking for the Staff of Kings, the staff that Moses used to part the Red Sea in the Bible, which Indy reads from Kingston's journal with all the enthusiasm of reading a cocktail menu. He must have been onto something. Something big. And Maggie, upon seeing a complete stranger read the ramblings of a crazy man who is obsessed with Moses, immediately decides that she is totes in with Indy for the entire rest of this journey. Let me save you some trouble. You're going to tell me that I can't come with you. You leave, I'll follow, and you'll keep wondering when I'll be showing up. Okay, this actually does turn out to be a trap later, but what does it say about the writing that I thought the game was being dead stupid serious with this lady? Kingston's journal leads to a museum in Istanbul some friggin' how, you have to read in the journal extras that it used to be a sultan's palace. Although the writers of the journal and the writers of the actual story aren't always on the same page. The journal says that the museum is only just now opening with a huge gala, and yet the cutscenes make clear that Kingston was here six years ago poking around their murals for clues. The cutscenes spell out that Maggie followed us to Istanbul, while the journal seems to think that she's here by massive coincidence. And somehow the Nazis are here too with no explanation of how they followed us here or got the information in the journal that only Indy has ever seen. Even the journal just kind of shrugs and gives up explaining that. The bad guys are just magic. So now you bungle around another temple looking for stuff to interact with as you hunt for four murals to make statues of knights rise out of the ground because somehow that has to do with Moses. This one room of the catacombs I stumbled around lost for like 10 minutes going nuts until by pure accident I walked into this one random wall that Indy climbed to continue the level. That's the kind of bull crap that the vast bulk of the game revolves around. And then to get past some crushing walls you need to jam some big stone gears with a skull pulled out of the wall. Istanbul was Constantinople, now it's Istanbul was Constantinople, been a long time gone. Constantinople's now a Turkish delight on a moonlit night. Every gal in Constantinople lives in Istanbul, not Constantinople, so if you've a date in Constantinople, she'll be waiting in Istanbul. Even old New York was once New Amsterdam. Why they changed it, I can't say. People just liked it better that way. So take me back to Constantinople. No, you can't go back to Constantinople. Been a long time gone. Constantinople, why did Constantinople get the works? That's nobody's business but the Turks. I spent about 20 minutes trying this before realizing that you're supposed to punch the skull into the gears. 
Maybe I'm the dumbass here, but literally anywhere else an item the size of these skulls would be a throwing item, and the icon looks like a throwing prompt. It just didn't click that I was supposed to specifically order Indy to jam his hand in between two grinding stone gears. Indy discovers a map leading to the Himalayas. He has no reaction to this massive discovery, and then Indy and Maggie make a thrilling escape on elephant back. Thrilling citation needed. It's all quick time events. You die if you don't order the elephant to charge through obstacles because an elephant can charge through flimsy wooden fences, but merely running at high speed through wooden fences kills you. I'd also like to know what kind of antimatter bullets Indy loads into his pistol that he can blow up cars from behind with two or three shots to the trunk. Next level, Indy and Maggie are climbing the Himalayas, and Maggie wanders off in the middle of the night, leaving Indy to go out and search for her in mid-blizzard. Nice try, game, but you're not going to make a worse mountain climbing game than Cursed Mountain. Though I admit, this is a valiant effort. This level sucks, as you can barely see in front of you. Scripted spots have wind blow you clear off the mountain unless you pass two abrupt quick time events and your health constantly drains unless you find and light fires that DON'T WANT TO LIGHT! Where's the button prompt? LIGHT! LIGHT, YOU PILE OF SHIT! It seriously wasn't until I was editing this video together that I figured out what's going on with the fires. You're supposed to drop a piece of wood into that little fire pit, except when you pick up the piece of wood, there's no actual use prompt to let you know that's what you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to, for no real reason or prompting, manually drop the piece of wood in a spot where it just so happens to fall on top of the fire pit. And then the critical game function works properly. After bumbling around lost a bit, Indy finds some locals and it turns out that Dr. Kingston is still alive. Indy has no reaction to this revelation. I knew if anyone could find this place, it'd be you. You should have brought your friend, though. Maggie, where is she? My god, Doc, you're alive! You see a hot piece of ass run through here? The locals apparently prevent anyone from actually going to the Staff of Kings, so... What? Has Kingston just been squatting here for six years, bugging the natives just for the hell of it? But it turns out the labyrinth of puzzles that we went through last level was only one of three shepherds leading to the Staff of Kings, and Valar has somehow found another one without the instructions, solved it, and gotten to Nepal in the time it took Indy just to head straight here. Suck ass! By now the hand-to-hand -hand combat has gotten really difficult, as there's an encounter here where you run out of weapons long before you run out of bad guys. That is, until you discover the ultimate weapon to end all the weapons, a PIPE WRENCH! Other weapons break, but PIPE WRENCH BREAKS YOU. And speaking of breaking, I am stuck! Can't move. Oh, wait, wait, uh, nope, nope, stuck again. Can't move. After the perplexingly shortest and most simplified temple in the game by a vast margin, Indy finds the legendary Staff of Kings. It's a stick. Drop that thing in the woods and it's friggin' gone, dude. But then Maggie comes across Indy and she finally reveals her deep, dark secret. She's actually working for British intelligence and they desperately want the Staff of Kings before the Nazis can use its power. And it was this exact moment in the game when I had this crystallizing realization of... What power? We're almost to the end of the game at this point, and they still haven't answered one basic question. What does the Staff of Kings actually do? This game knows a whole three things about the story of Moses. Baby in the water, burning bush, and that he parted the Red Sea. So it's all but stated that all the Staff of Kings does is part bodies of water. Which is cool and all, but how is being able to part the sea actually useful to either side of a war in an age where boats and planes are readily available? We can already cross the water just fine. You could use this staff to drive tanks and artillery across bodies of water, I guess. Really slowly and conspicuously to where they'd be sitting ducks for bombers. If we're being generous, maybe you could use it to sink naval vessels, but Germany already had a fleet of U-boats for that and you have one staff that has to travel to every front in the world 
and really hope that the one guy with the one staff doesn't get shot down or blown up on the front lines. Let's just compare the Staff of Kings to the other MacGuffins that Indiana Jones has quested for. The Ark of the Covenant is a direct channel to the will and might of God himself. Everyone wants it to use as a total doomsday weapon. The Holy Grail grants immortality, loaded down with restrictions as it later turns out to be. Everyone wants it so as to not die. Archimedes' dial can time travel. Everyone wants it so they can bend all of history to their will. Even the Tower of Babel from the Infernal Machine game opens the doorway to a pagan god and an alien dimension. It's a channel for limitless power, to the point that even its components give you superpowers of invisibility, super strength, and flight. And then there's the Staff of Kings, which lets you walk somewhere that you could much more easily reach by boat. Big Fat Hairy Deal in most indie stories, it's made readily clear why it's important indie tracks this stuff down before the bad guys do, but here, none of the writers took two seconds to ask, wait, why does everyone want this thing again? Just another layer of half-assed writing. Though I guess I can see Britain's perspective on this one. Dunkirk would have gone a hell of a lot differently if they could just part the sea and walk home. <laughs> Whatever. Voler shows up to steal the staff and kidnap Maggie at gunpoint. And despite having eons to just shoot his mortal enemy dead, he lets Indy go to trap him in a collapsed temple. I was stuck in this room for a while, since your only clue of what to do is that Indy says there's a crack in the wall. Which there isn't. There's plenty of stuff that looks like I can interact with it, like an iced over chariot that I could use earlier. But again, this boiled down to bumping Indy into everything in the room until I stumbled across the one thing I'm allowed to do. This one unmarked ledge lets you climb up to where it'll let you whip the chariot loose to bust out. And then Indy escapes by straddling a massive stone statue of the baby Moses that I don't buy would float for one second. This could have been a neat surfing section. Instead, it's quick time events. And at the end of the river, Indy just so happens to fly off a waterfall and land on the airship the Germans are using to escape. What are the freaking odds? Indy just shoots his way through the entire airship like he's friggin' Rambo, culminating in an infuriating fist fight while you're dogpiled by guys who dodge all your stuff. Frantically running around throwing whatever wasn't glued down is how I got out of this. Kingston is somehow also kidnapped, I guess, and he sacrifices himself to keep Voler from shooting Indy. Congratulations! You being alive was a completely pointless twist. Voler just raises the staff and yells for some reason, and all of a sudden Indy, Maggie, Voler, and just enough motorcycles for a chase have abruptly teleported down to the parted seafloor. And of course the final boss is more motion controls. Hold the remotes like handlebars and turn them to steer. Doesn't seem to be working. Maybe the controls aren't- OH SHIT! The final level has you chasing Voler on a motorcycle that steers with wildly oversensitive motion controls through a tight trench of parted water. And it sucks. One slight wrong move kills you and you better keep the remotes held like handlebars while the game respawns you or else you'll jump back in and immediately veer off to your death again. The sick thing is that most of this course is just a straight line that it'd be piss easy to navigate if you could steer with a control stick. So the deliberately crappy motion controls are the final obstacle here. Since Voler himself doesn't even attack you. Hell, you kill Voler by Indy pulling a rocket launcher out of his ass and heroically shooting the main villain in the back. And then Indy just punches him out to drown in a cutscene. You don't even directly fight the main villain. Come to think of it, the only actual boss we ever fought in the game was the fire Nazi dude who I still don't know how he actually works. What the hell? So Voler dies, Indy and Maggie escape with the staff, and the staff turns into a snake and slithers off for some reason. The end. Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings on the Wii is not a good game. I seriously struggle to come up with one thing that it does well. The combat is an interesting idea, but balanced to be confusing and annoying. The gunplay levels are the most stock rail shooter ever. The tomb exploration is so restrictive as to not be compelling. And the already stock story has so many glaring holes where crap is just missing 
that the game barely has a story at all. Not to mention, the game looks ducking ugly! And that's all before you get into the shoehorn motion controls, which didn't bother me too much, except for the horrifically bad speed waggle quick time events and the insanely sensitive final boss, if you can even call it that. I've heard the PlayStation Portable version is better, given that it was made by an entirely different dev team, but as bad as the Wii port is, there is one very major reason why you may want to pick up a copy. And no, it's not because you can play as Han Solo if you find all the artifacts. The game has so-called glory moves, which are basically achievements, and one such glory move is for shooting down at least four planes in the vehicle section at the end of the tutorial. And why should you care? Because in the game's extras menu there are three additional gameplay modes, and completing that one single piss-easy glory achievement snags you the real treasure. A fully functional port of the PC game Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Widely regarded as a classic point-and-click adventure game, as well as one of the best Indiana Jones titles ever made. All you have to do is beat Staff of Kings' tutorial, and you can gain access to a vastly better game that was Trojan-horsed into this shitty one. I almost wonder if A2M knew their game wasn't working, and they snuck in this apology to make up for it. And yeah, Fate of Atlantis is a legitimately great game, full of brain-tingling puzzles, interesting characters, an engaging story, and gorgeous pixel art that thrashes anything you'll find in the blurry, washed-out dishwater that is the main Staff of Kings game. So much like Indiana Jones himself digging through layers of mud and bullshit to find a valuable treasure, we found some worth in Staff of Kings, after all. Kinda. Sorta. You could probably find it on GOG instead. <laughs>